Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about beta oxidation of fatty acids. So, beta oxidation of fatty acid is a catabolic process by which fatty acid molecules are broken down and generates acetyl CoA. So, let's talk about the type of reaction. It is a catabolic reaction, that means breaking down type of reaction. And the site of reaction is mitochondria and to some extent it also takes place in the peroxisome. However, there, is, there are some differences in mitochondrial versus peroxisomal beta oxidation. So let's just look at a mitochondria and try to understand the process of beta oxidation in bit more details. So here is a mitochondria and you can see a zoomed in view. Now inside the mitochondria, Fatty acyl-CoA, in this particular case, the example is spermatoyl-CoA, a 16-carbon fatty acid. The fatty acyl-CoA ultimately gets converted to uh, acyl-CoA, in this case, midistoyl-CoA, and it releases acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA that is released can be channeled into TCA cycle, and ultimately, the high-energy uh, compounds that are produced from the TCA cycle such as NADH and FADH can be utilized in the electron transport chain to generate ATP. That's the goal. But looking at the beta oxidation of fatty acid, we have to consider few aspects. And these few aspects are where does beta oxidation takes place? And we have a clue about that. Second is like under what condition beta oxidation takes place? Third is what are the enzymes that helps in beta oxidation process. Obviously inside the body any reaction or any biochemical pathway would be enzyme driven. So we have to understand what are the enzymes that are regulating this pathway. And lastly how beta oxidation process is regulated depending upon the demand. So let's begin. Now the metabolic state is the key aspect or the key circumstances under which fatty acid oxidation is favored. For example, in the fed state, when the body has too much of energy, then fatty acid anabolism is preferred. At that state, body would prefer to store the fat in adipose tissue. But in fasted state, the fat would be broken down and it would be utilized to generate energy. Right? So let's look at this process in bit more details. So let's assume we are right now in a fasted state and in the fasted state inside the adipose tissue the triglycerides the triglycerides would be broken down to generate free fatty acids now these free fatty acids would be carried into the liver and the, in the liver hepatocytes the mitochondria of liver hepatocytes they would be broken down and they would be oxidized and the ultimate goal is to generate energy under the circumstances of fasting. Because in the fasting, we don't have supply of food. So, glucose level is limiting. Now, fatty acid would be ultimately converted to acetyl-CoA inside the mitochondria. And the enzymes which are important are present in the mitochondrial matrix. So, let's look at the mitochondrial matrix to understand this process in a lot more details. But there is a basic question. How does fatty acid get inside the mitochondria? Because the mitochondrial inner membrane is impermeable to the fatty acid. So it turns out there are transporter mechanisms present in the mitochondrial inner and outer membrane which helps the fatty acid to get inside. So there is a small molecule known as carnitine. The carnitine makes a conjugation with this fatty acid. For example, in this case, it's a palmitoyl carnitine. And this adduct is actually transported by carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 or commonly known as CPT1 present in the outer mitochondrial membrane. And ultimately using a carnitine acyl translocase channel, the palmitoyl carnitine gets inside the mitochondrial matrix. Now with the help of carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2, the palmitoyl CoA is released and the carnitine molecule is recycled back to the cytosol. Now the palmitoyl CoA which is inside the mitochondrial matrix is the starting material for beta oxidation process. Ultimately in an enzymatic process 
this palmitoyl coa would generate acetyl coa several molecules of that we would look at the count of how many acetyl coa would be produced so stay tuned till the end of this video now inside the mitochondrial matrix this is our starting material permitting palmitoyl coa now notice that the carbon atom which is just near the functional group is the alpha carbon and the carbon nearby is the beta carbon this process is known as beta oxidation so a lot of changes are going to happen in the beta carbon so we need to take a look at the beta carbon at each step palmitoyl coa would be converted to trans delta 2 enoyl coa as you can understand that there would be a, a double bond formation between alpha and beta carbon in shorter in short we can say hydrogen number is reduced in other ways we can say there is oxidation taking place and the enzyme that triggered this process is known as acyl coa dehydrogenase as you know these dehydrogenase enzymes can perform oxidation reaction right so from trans to enoyl coa it would be converted to beta hydroxy acyl coa and again if you look at the beta carbon a hydroxy group is attached right now so it is oxidized further and the enzyme is enoyl coa hydratase point to be noted that at the first step fadh2 is produced later on i'll tell you what this fadh2 and nadh is used for then beta hydroxy acyl coa gets converted to beta keto acyl coa where the beta carbon is now having a carbonyl group which is even more oxidized version than a uh, than an alcohol right and the enzyme which is triggering this process is known as beta hydroxy acyl coa dehydrogenase again another dehydrogenase enzyme so majorly there are two oxidation step in this whole beta oxidation process and every time the beta carbon is changing in this process something is reduced which is nad nad is reduced into nadh NADH and FADH2 would be utilized later on in the electron transport chain to generate energy. Ultimately, a acyl CoA molecule would be produced along with the acetyl CoA. So, two number of carbon is reduced from this long chain. So, if this chain was 16 carbon long, now it has become 14 carbon long because two carbon acetyl CoA is moved out. Now, the acyl CoA, in this case the meristoyl CoA, can be acted further up by other enzymes. I forgot to mention that the last step is catalyzed by thiolase. Now, these four enzymes are the key enzymes for beta oxidation. Now, look at the beta carbon. How at different stages there are changes in the uh, groups associated with the beta carbon, right? So that is why it is the beta oxidation of fatty acid. So let's assume this is the 16 carbon palmitoyl uh, CoA or palmitic acid. It would be eventually broken down into 14 carbon, then 12 carbon, and gradually it would release all the uh, molecules and the cycle would round about seven cycles. It would eventually give the product would be 8 molecules of acetyl CoA, 7 molecules of FADH2, and 7 molecules of NADH. All these NADH and FADH2 can be further utilized in the electron transport chain. Now, strictly speaking, all these four enzymes that are important for fatty acid oxidation, all these enzymes are not individual entities. They actually form a trifunctional protein complex which is a heterooctomer having four alpha four beta subunits now the beta subunits contain the activity for thiolase and the alpha subunit has a dual activity for the hydratase and the hydroxy acyl coa dehydrogenase so dehydrogenase and hydratase activities are present are intrinsic properties of the alpha subunit of this big trifunctional proteins any fatty acid which is greater than 12 carbon are processed by these trifunctional protein and this kind of depiction of four 
individual enzymes are a bit primitive. Now let's try to understand what happens to this meristyle CoA and just an overview. So this meristyle CoA would ultimately be broken down into acetyl CoA. Each time the acetyl CoA is produced, it can be channeled into the Krebs cycle. Ultimately, in this process of conver converting the meristyl CoA to acetyl CoA, several molecules of NADH and FADH2 would be generated. And also, the acetyl CoA which has entered into the Krebs cycle would also produce NADH and FADH. All of these NADH and FADH2 would be channeled to the electron transport chain. They would donate their electron to the electron transport chain and proton would be pumped into the intermembrane space. As a result, using the proton gradient, the ATP synthase would generate ATP. Now, this is the key goal of beta oxidation. Beta oxidation's key goal is to break down the fatty acid in the time of starvation when the body needs fatty acid, acid breakdown to generate energy. Now, we would learn about a little bit about paroxysmal beta oxidation and try to appreciate how it is different from a mitochondrial beta oxidation. Now, all the enzymes that uh, carry out the beta oxidation process in paroxysm is also very similar, but only difference is in case of paroxysmal beta oxidation, the FADH2 is not channeled into the electron transport chain. Rather, it is utilized to reduce oxygen into hydrogen peroxide and that's how peroxisomes produced hydrogen peroxide and for peroxisom to produce hydrogen peroxide beta oxidation is super important so now we can appreciate the same process in two different organelles and how they are different in a certain aspect now let's try to understand the regulation of fatty acid catabolism process so fatty acid catabolism process is under regulation of hormones, transcriptional regulations at regulation and regulations at several different levels. We would restrict our discussion to hormonal restriction, hormonal regulations and transcriptional regulations. So we looked at the first and the foremost step is to transport fatty acid from the cytoplasm to the mitochondrial matrix where the fatty acid would be broken down. If the fatty acid which is present in the cytoplasm is not transported to the mitochondrial matrix, it won't be broken down and utilized. So this transport process is regulated. By whom? By several hormones such as insulin and glucagon. It turns out malonyl-CoA is an inhibitor of CPT1. Now how malonyl coa is produced? Malonyl coa is in turn produced by acetyl coa and from malonyl coa fatty acid biosynthesis can take place. Now malonyl coa would be only generated when there is sufficient amount of acetyl coa or in the fed state. Now acetyl coa carboxylase triggers this process. Acetyl coa carboxylase is active when insulin is there and we all know that insulin is there when there is a fed state or when there is enough amount of glucose. So presence of insulin ensures that acetyl-CoA carboxylase is active, acetyl-CoA is converted to malonyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA shuts off the transferring the transfer process of fatty acid from cytoplasm to the mitochondrial matrix. Rather, malonyl-CoA inhibits the CPT1 and it triggers the fatty acid biosynthesis pathway rather than the fatty acid uh, breakdown process. So in the fed state, we would understand that fatty acid biosynthesis is favored rather than the fatty acid breakdown. In contrast, in the fasted state, fatty acid breakdown would be favored rather than fatty acid biosynthesis. So we understand how hormonal level can regulate these beta oxidation process. Now metabolic demand is a big factor that regulates fatty acid biosynthesis at a transcriptional level. So first body need to understand that it is undergoing a fasted state and that body can, body can understand that situation by the comparing the ATP and AMP ratio. ATP and AMP ratio is detected by a molecular sensor known as AMP kinase. 
AMP kinase is also known as the master regulator of catabolism. So it would activate all kind of catabolic processes, including beta oxidation. AMPK also shuts off all anabolism by inhibiting the master regulator of anabolism, mTOR C1. Now AMPK activates PGC1 alpha, which in turn activates PPAR alpha. PPAR uh, or paroxysmal proliferation factor associated receptors are actually nuclear receptors whose targets are several genes of beta oxidation pathway. And that is how at the transcriptional level beta oxidation pathway genes can be transcribed in an increased rate when there is nutrient deficiency or there is a fall of ATP concentration in the body. So at least we learned about two different kind of regulations which can uh, determine how much beta oxidation to uh, how much how much beta oxidation can take place and under which circumstances. So in this video we overall looked at the beta oxidation process, the necessity of it. We looked at several aspects of the beta oxidation process. We compared paroxysmal beta oxidation process with the mitochondrial one. We looked at the enzyme complexes which are involved and ultimately we looked at hormonal and transcriptional regulation of beta oxidation process. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.